Hi. Okay, Mike, with you aboard, can you hear us okay? I hear you just fine. Okay. Thank you. Then we will convene, convene the meeting at this point. It is 105, I have. Welcome, everybody. It's been a minute since we've had a meeting, and we're revisiting uh, another adjunct to what we talked about last time around. So it'll be interesting. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. We do have a quorum for the record. Okay, uh, Lori, would you do roll call, please? Yes. Do we have Director Bill Herman here? Yes. Do we have Director Sharon Delabar here? Yes. Do we have uh, Vice Chair Mike McAleer here? Pretty much. Okay. <laughs> Do we have Chair Helen Bernard here? Here. Do we have Director Joe Murray here? Here. Do we have Director Johanna Barty here? No. Okay. Okay, and for the record, we do not have a representative from Forks at this time, but Rod is working out there to uh, solve that situation. So we hope that we will in the future so it'll be easier to get a quorum and where we'll have input from the West End. All right, um, the first thing we need to do because the bylaws call for appointing a new chairman every year is to appoint a chair, uh, to approve a chair and a vice chair. Um, I am happy to, uh, serve as chairman. Again, I have no problem with that at all, unless somebody has a burning desire to do that. Um, uh, just... Could I uh, could I uh, speak? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Uh, I'd like to uh, just tell everybody that I think that Alan has done a superb job in the past. He's probably more knowledgeable about the, the uh, WAC and the uh, uh, county code that uh, deals with the opportunity fund. He's represented us well in front of the board of commissioners a number of times in the, uh, in the time that he's been the chair. So I nominate Alan Bernard as the uh, chair of the Fallon County Opportunity Fund board. Thank you, Mike. I'll send you the 20 bucks later. I'll second that. <laughs> All right, we have a second by Joe. Um, it, it, there's been seeing hearing no other nominations. Is there any discussion about the nomination on the floor? Seeing none, I will call for the question. All those in favor? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, then, motion passes. Um, at this point, we need a vice chair. So, um, Mike, are you willing uh, to serve another term as vice chairman? Be happy to do that. All right. Do we have a motion on the table for Mike or anyone else? I'll, I'll move to. All right. Joe Murray moves that you right. be uh, vice chair. For Mike Mackler to be vice chair. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Bill Henry. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? I would say thank you, uh, Mike. I appreciate it because you've got a long tenure with this committee as well. You know all the background and your contributions are quite valuable. So thank you so much. At this point, I'll call for the question. All in favor of Mike McAleer to continue as vice chairman say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, motion carries. We have a chair and a vice chairman. So I am allowed to move forward into the agenda at this point. Now, having said that, I the only remarks I have to kick it off um, for the record is that uh, any of the public that may be uh, contacting us by Zoom or in person, there will be time for additional comments uh, at the end after the presentation of the materials so that everyone will have a chance to speak um, should they wish to. And with that, I will turn over the floor to, what do we have? Uh, there's someone that wanted to join the meeting. So a member of the public, Megan Luker. Yeah, from the city as well. All right, is that okay? Mm -hmm. We're all Okay, welcome, Megan. Um, if you want to make any comments, uh, we will have time for that after the presentation uh, of the application and the financials. So if you have something to say, there will be time for it in a little while. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. All right, we have nothing else at this point. Uh, Colleen, uh, Executive Director for EDC, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so. 
I have included an item for consideration to modify the form definition. Uh, yes. Lauren. Is, am I missing? Are you doing the, the order? Right up there, oh, yes. on the agenda. Okay, yeah. sorry. I was looking at the wrong page. Sorry. Okay. Make sure. um, the bylaws that were uh, approved were done so in 1999. And it states a form shall be considered present for a meeting of the Opportunity Fund Board present when there are five members present. However, the county's Fallon County Administrative Code Board and Committee's policies and procedures, which was updated um, since that time, allows for at least 50% of the committee's members. Uh, if a quorum consisting of at least 50% of committee's members is not present, any business transaction is null and void. But anyway, so it allows for uh, a quorum to be defined as four members or 50% or more, at least 50%. So um, my recommended action is to move to amend the Opportunity Fund bylaws to state a quorum shall be considered present for a meeting of an opportunity fund board meeting when at least 50% of members are present. I will entertain a motion to that effect. So moved. So moved by Sharon. Second? Second. Second, Second by Joe. Joe. All right, discussion. Just makes sense. This is ridiculous. You have seven members and require five to quorum. Thank you. Any other comments? I would agree with that. Okay, then. Uh, hearing no other, uh, no other comments, I will call for the question. All those in favor of accepting the uh, recommended action uh, as outlined by Colleen, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? No. All right. Motion carries. And that's taken care of. Next part, thank you, Colleen. Next part is the uh, approval of the minutes. It's been a while, but you all have it in your notes. Did you get a chance to go over them? Everybody got them. I, right, so you've had a chance. I move to that them. we. Uh, I move that we approve the the uh, minutes as submitted. All right. We have a motion by Mike to accept the minutes as submitted. Oh, we'll second. second. Joe, what's we'll that? I'll second. Second. The second. Joe seconded. All right. Any discussions, additions, deletions, or clarifications on the minutes? This was beautifully done, by the way. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Very comprehensive. All right, seeing no discussion, I'll call for the question. Uh, Mike has proposed that we accept the minutes as submitted. I'll say aye. 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 Opposed? aye. All right, minutes are accepted from December 17th, 2021. My goodness. Not time flies when you're having fun. All right, going back to Colleen, at this point, we have some administrative duties to go through here that fall on. Uh, Colleen, so you had the floor. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, at this time, need to ask if any of the board members have any conflicts of interest as per the Opportunity Fund Board Bylaws dated 1999 in relation to this application for the City of Forks Wastewater uh, Treatment Facility Supplemental Funding. Let's start with Mike McAleer. Uh, no conflict. Thank you. Joe? No conflict. No. no conflict. No conflict. No conflict with me. All right. Staying none, Colleen. We're good. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next is a discussion of the modification uh, that occurred by the legislature in 2021. And then again, in 2024, there was what they re the um, legislature referred to as a technical fix. Uh, the, the use of the proceeds now allows for, uh, also affordable workforce housing infrastructure or facilities. And that was the case previously, um, but we're just highlighting again that, uh, the county now has modified their code to align with the allowance that the RCWs provide. The county could have said, County could have, commissioners could have decided, no, we're just going to leave this for economic development purposes. But this was allowing counties to broaden the scope of the use of funds. So um, the affordable workforce housing infrastructure 
facilities means, means housing infrastructure facilities that a qualifying provider uses for housing for a single person, family, or unrelated mm -hmm. persons living together whose income is no more than 120% of the median income adjusted for housing size for the county where the housing uh, is located. Nothing in this section shall be deemed to require that qualified providers permitted to or required to consider the source of the tenants or prospective tenant source of income in determining eligibility in contravention of RCW 5918-255. The update in 2024, the technical fix was to inform, to clarify to all counties that this also included land. So now eligible applicants, uh, which or a qualifying provider of affordable housing, which is a nonprofit or a, um, a housing authority for our county, Peninsula Housing Authority, um, that they could also use it to buy land. So that was basically the technical fix from 2024. So the funds that are available in this opportunity fund at the county now are available for infrastructure that is owned by a government or for economic development purposes or affordable workforce housing purposes. So up to 120% area median income, or it can be used to actually build the facility or it can be used to buy the land for a facility that would house people with 120% AMI or below. So with that, I know part of your role and your scope as minimum responsibility of the board uh, is that you should um, also be looking at uh, the overall uh, upcoming potential applications and then also uh, how much is available and taking all of this kind of information into account. So because we now have opened it up for affordable workforce housing, I would ask Tim Dalton to join us, who is the county's, I call him the housing guru, but that's not his official title, um, the Fallon County Housing Grants and Resource Director. Please, Sorry. please note that Kenneth Reander has joined the meeting online. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> Here. I want the like roller. Yeah, I'll take the roller. And set the good one yeah. for the guests. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk this afternoon. I kind of want to run through a little, um, like say, the RCW that the county has approved at this point in time has allowed for housing up to 120% of AMI, it has not included the land. That takes effect in July of June this year. 6th. Huh? June 6th. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they will go through and look to amend county code to match up with what's going on. Um, you know, and I think actually with Rod's application here today is a great um, case in point for this. Uh, Peninsula Housing Authority, is one of the entities here, the housing authority that would be able to use this money to acquire and develop more land. They just finished five houses out in Forks that the people moved into uh, right before Thanksgiving. You know, so, and like I say, I think Rob will attest that the wage, 120% of AMI, uh, Forks' is AMI is a little lower than what the county's is. Um, so that they really, I mean, you know, with, uh, with what they're doing, we have two other funds. We have a 1406 fund and a 1590. Uh, 1406 generates about $150,000 a year. It's a smaller percentage. And then um, in 22, the county approved 1590 funds. That is one tenth of one percent. And it's generating That's sales tax revenue. Sales tax revenue, yes. Um, and with those funds that they are starting now, we're starting to see projects come through for allocation for those uh, from the um, NGO, non-governmental organizations are coming through, starting to apply for those. Just 
curious, the one tenth of one percent on the fifteen ninety. That's approximately how much. That's generating uh, about one point two million dollars a year. And like I said, we've been cumulative. It's nicer than one hundred and fifty. Huh? Nicer than one hundred and fifty. Really? Yeah. Well, you know, like <laughs> say, uh, one hundred fifty really doesn't do. The problem is, I'm calling a little test, is that with these projects, that everything is prevailing wage. <clears throat> So they are 50%, at least 50% more expensive to do than, you know, a standard uh, contractor going in and trying to build high density multifamily units. Um, the Housing Solution Committee will be meeting next week, and um, we're working with Peninsula Behavioral Health to do a project that's going to be a $12 million project. I'm talking with Sarah Martinez with the housing, and she's looking at a project out in um, Eklund Heights, which is an unincorporated area of the UGA, unincorporated GGA area. But those are sort of the areas. And there's also the one in Squim that PBH is doing. It's re remodeling. The PBH, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, corner a, of um, Fifth and Fur. And so that's $250,000 to modify that building. So that is something that the Housing Solutions Committee is really looking at is, and there's a list of 16 different projects, I right. think the last yes. I saw. And, you know, they, the, the commissioners attend every Housing Solutions Committee meeting and they can't piecemeal this out, unfortunately, because if they do, there's not enough money to get a project actually going. So they are looking at bonding the funds. Correct. Yes, and the issue with the bonding is that we can take up to 50% of any yearly allocation bond against it can generate in the neighborhood of uh, about $10 million to get it to do a project. The issue with it is, is that that money has to be allocated out within three years. And 85% of it has to be spent within the first three years. And kind of one of the biggest challenges, with the exception of somewhere like Forks, if you get into Port Angeles and you get into Squim, you know, it takes you a year and a half to get a project through planning. To How get, many? Yeah, to get to get a shovel on the ground. Um, but you, you know. have to have committed funding before you can go to permitting. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's, you know, chicken and the egg kind yeah. of problem. But it is possible, too, that an applicant for opportunity funds could bond against the opportunity funds as well. Mm -hmm. oh. And so there is, at the end, uh, I'll go over the um, financials in more detail in a minute, but at the end of the year, there should be $5.1 million available, I believe, uh, in opportunity, 5.6, I'm sorry, 5.674 million by the end of the year based on the inflows and outflows of funding to include uh, what the um, the first allocation from the city of Forks, the 2.375 million that was awarded to them. But since we'll get to that, there have been delays on it. They haven't actually taken that money and uh, reimbursed, given it to the city of Forks yet. So that's still sitting there. That's why the amount is going to drop. But I'll get into those details. But so, you know, 5.6 million. I anticipate that there, and I have had a lot of conversations with Peninsula Housing Authority, with um, Sarge's Place, with Peninsula Behavioral Health. You know, they are looking at these funds to make applications for some of the housing projects that they're working on. Well, like that, and I believe you know, using these funds, like say, with projects out in force, you know, even the you know potential for uh, private contractors to come in and build housing within there. I mean, it's all workforce development, putting people in work, building. You know, it's kind of what you know, economic development mm -hmm. is housing. The problem with bonding these funds, though, is that. That means that future revenues would be allocated to a bond that was approved from this funding source. So if future revenues would have to go to pay, pay off that bond. So I'm just explaining that this is a possibility. It could come up. I'm not saying it is, or uh, but 
just uh, be aware that it, they would be um, allocating future funds to pay off a bond if somebody came and applied for uh, the, the funds and wanted to bond it. So it's sort of like cards. Yes, yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. And from the like say, more housing solutions committee and using when we look at the 1590, that they will look at what is you know the highest and best use. They you know that do you spend you know do you go into a six million dollar project that's going to do you know 15 houses or 15 units or are you looking for that 60 unit development that if you're going to put this you're going to get the house and best use for a period of time speak to though the complication of 1406 and 1590 funds that if so what developers nonprofit housing developers do is they try to stack capital you know a little bit from this uh pot of money a little bit here this is for housing up to 120 percent and is is characterized as workforce but 1406 and 1590 funds is capped at 60 percent so that means that if they were trying to do a capital stack and use some 1406 or 1590 funds then that and if they asked for funds from this project they couldn't take people that maybe made what is 120 percent of AMI 100 percent of AMI is 80,000 for a four family of four but for a single person it is 58.9 Fifty-eight nine. So they would have to be at half of that. So twenty, you know, twenty-nine thousand dollars. And so that's another consideration. Another complication is that if somebody came and applied for this funding. You're really looking at funding a project that would, for a single person, they're only making twenty-nine thousand dollars. So is that really going towards workforce housing, economic development? That's a something to consider. I have no opinion. I'm just pointing out <laughs> because then, yeah, you know, there's you're know, looking at there is um, uh, USDA does a lot of the habitat and a lot of low interest family loans, those sort of things in rural areas or rural developments. There are meeting in April in the Tri Cities. I'm going to be attending that because I think they need to be raising. Right now, they're eighty percent of AMI for rural. They need to be taking that to one hundred and twenty percent to make you know because like Rod can attest. I mean, our our missing middle here is still one of our biggest problems. That you know you either have to be below and be in habitat housing, or you have to be you know one hundred and seventy five percent of AMI or higher to get into a house when your average house is four hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. So that's an area that if USDA, because what they could do with rural loans is they could take it out 38 years. That they can, they're stretching the loans out longer that's making it more affordable for the workflow working class to get into housing. And I want to see them, like say Seattle's doing to 120, Habitat's doing to 120% of AMI, but they're going through a private lender. Need to see more USDA and rural areas start expanding that too for our workforce. So I bring this up not because it's for you to consider today for this application, but to be thinking about for future applications and you know maybe some discussions. Uh, and it would be good to get you know some input from the county commissioners. What is their strategic version of the, they did open up these funds for workforce housing, but again, if, because the cost is so expensive with prevailing wages that are our prevailing county prevailing wages for residential projects are higher than King counties. Wow. And that's a, I know why that technically happens and we're trying to address that. Um, we're working with L and I, but uh, it just costs so, so much money if you use a government dollar on any kind of capital projects, especially with residential. But you probably will be 
in the next year, year and a half, you probably will be hearing from PBH or PHA, a peninsula yeah. housing on a project that, you know, I know Annie's kind of looking and she's talking about with the complex um, things coming up for the county, but she's going to get some courage in there that really. Um, and that, that could, you know, uh, from what their projects cost, they could ask for 5 million. And so that's something for you to consider, or do you think that there should be some funds that remain for economic development opportunities? Okay, good, good background there at this point, and thank you for your input, appreciate that. Um, I have just one quick question. <laughs> like you said, time flies so fast. What's the remaining time on the Carlsberg? Um, I, Got that information under financial. Um, can you look? Mitch? Didn't it start at the tenth? Um, I don't. They did. They didn't provide that spreadsheet. Um, this time they provided this, but we do have it from previous years under finances, uh, Mitch, and fund balance. Uh, it's a Excel spreadsheet, and I can get that to you before oh, the end. I mean, I was just curious. Mm -hmm. Future. Uh, uh, calling minimum responsibilities of the board? Uh, yes. Let's see. Keep uh, in mind that what's being asked of us. We always do that beforehand, so we're clear what's being asked today, what we need to accomplish. So, the so things you should be considering is the cost of the proposal in relation to the project's potential to create economic development. The priority of the project with other economic development projects included in the public facilities or comp plans of the city, the readiness of the project, uh, whether a loan could be considered for a portion of the funding proposal, particularly if the project is that is for a utility that when completed has the potential to generate revenue through user rates. And lastly, the need to retain funds for known future projects that have high priority in the community. Okay, so in our deliberations, we're kind of weighing our responses against these five items that we're concentrating on. All right, then, if we're clear on that, Colleen. Um, at this point, let's go over the opportunity funds and see where we're at. Great. Um, so, first off, on the first page under assets balance, <laughs> you'll see uh, that. As of the end of February, the balance was 8.128 million, 129 million. Uh, that's right here. And this came from the CFO of uh, the county, Mark Lane. So that's that's the most important item for that the, the balance uh, of the account. And then on the third page or the last page, are the amounts and what I'm uh, bringing to, to your attention is the 2024 budget. So, uh, which is that first column of numbers, they anticipate there will be 1.9 million in uh, local retail sales and use tax. And then um, system development fees, which I think that's, yeah, the last page. Right here, yeah. So 1.9 million from the 2024 budget is what they anticipate. Oh, I think this, this, sorry, this right here. This That's, one. Oh. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. There you go. Uh -huh. um, it makes a difference. <laughs> yeah. 1.9 million is the revenue that they expect to receive from the uh, taxes. And then 15,000 from system development fees, which would be Carlsberg sewer fees. Uh, investment interest, 150,000, because it's all in the LGIP, the local government investment pool, which is now getting 5.45%. The last I was told. And um, a little bit of money from a uh, transfer from a local and uh, LID from a sewer line. So just over $2 million will be the revenues. And they anticipate that the prior application for the city of Forks wastewater treatment facility of 2.375 million 
will go out this year. And um, they've got different principal payments, as you spoke about, Director Delavar, the, um, the how they bonded these funds to pay Carlsberg sewer. Um, that's 344000 that comes out annually. And then they anticipate a transfer to Clown Bay CQ sewer, and they're anticipating a uh, transfer to Carlsberg sewer of 350000 So the total at the end of the year uh, of inflows and outflows will be a negative $2.172 million, which will take that you know, $8 million balance down to $5.674 million. And if you approve this 295, then we're down to about 5.3 million in, at the end of the year without consideration of other applications that could come in. Okay, any questions on that? Third mud. Actually, right. the way the Carlsberg had been explained initially, this is what I was anticipating. Mitch, were you able to find when the the last payment will be? Yes. So uh, it looks like, yeah, Carlsberg sewer loan matures in 2020. Uh, the skill center loan, and that's uh, about 340, 300, uh, yeah, 340, 50, 60,000 every year until June 2048. Um, the Department of Commerce Skill Center loan matures uh, in 2025 next year. So, but that's only $48,000 that comes off of this annually. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're good on financial then. Um, on 2024 applications, I think you already covered that, didn't you? What you're anticipating? Yes. Or do you want to cover that no, again? No, that's great. You're good. Okay. Yeah. All right, then, on the application review at this point, we need to open the public meeting. So the public meeting is hereby opened at this point. And Colleen, again, over to you for the administrative overview of this particular application. Okay. As administrator, it's incumbent upon me to ensure all special conditions are met by fund recipients. Since the last meeting, I can report that $2,375,610 were approved by the Board of County Commissioners, and I have no other updates to provide under that requirement. The EDC reviewed the Fork Supplemental Wastewater Treatment Facility application for $295,000 and found it to be complete and suitable for funding under the program guidelines. The EDC staff uh, EDC, let's see, um, the, the pro, okay, so I've announced the project and we, uh, have ensured that the $295,000, uh, would create jobs and, and either create or retain existing jobs, um, and then, any more details would be presented by uh, Rod Fleck, the city planner and uh, city council. Thank you. Do we have any other questions before you begin, Rob? Any other questions from uh, anyone here regarding what she just covered on uh, the administrative overview? Oh, we all close. And I did review their audit, and it is. Uh, they meet all the requirements from the statute. So they meet them and the application meets the necessary uh, requirements that we are, we can move forward on. Mm -hmm. All right then, um, Rod, you have the floor to present your funding report. Great, thank you, Chairman Bernard and members of the Opportunity Fund Board. Thank you for having me here. I'd like to again reintroduce Paul Hampton. He's our public works director and is the one that oversees, I'd always say anything that can break Paul's job is to try to fix it. <laughs> So, um, and his crew is pretty remarkable. 
uh, in doing just that. So they've been pretty diligent. You have a tool belt for you? It's, in, it's probably in the truck. <laughs> um, so we, we've been pretty blessed by a remarkable group of individuals. And it would not be uh, inappropriate for the city to first call out uh, that your meeting minutes show 2021. Audrey Bradham was our court treasurer. She really spearheaded this effort for an opportunity fund request. Originally, Audrey, unfortunately, has passed away. And um, this is one of the legacies of Audrey's work for the city. The other person that deserves a shout out from the city is Danny Walgren, who's worked for over three decades as a wastewater treatment plant operator, gets 100% compliance from the Department of Ecology for meeting all the requirements of the compliance operation. Those two individuals have kept us going, but the reality is the system is in desperate need of redundancy improvement. Back in 2021, an application came in uh, for $2.375 million from the Opportunity Fund that was being matched by over a million dollars in the City of Forks American Rescue Plan Act. That was 94.5% of all the monies the City of Forks was going to get from what's sometimes referred to as ARPA funds, uh, COVID relief funds, et cetera. The council made a decision to invest that, which is one of the options in utility and repair and upgrade, in large part because we have a system that's um, built in the 1980s that is the central core district of Forks, predominantly the business core, and the school, the hospital with some like all little side wings, but it's predominantly the business core. And it was built when there was a ban on any buildings going back into Forks in the 80s until that system had been built. So it's essential to the retaining the jobs in our business core, along with the school and the hospital, which are two larger employers. Um, one of the reasons we asked for that back, those funds back then in the form of a grant, was that our household median income, as Tim Dalton noted, is around 65% of the county's household median income, which is around 70% of the state's median income. So it's uh, there's a disparity as you go west of the LWA with regard to household incomes. The, the amount was awarded by the Board of Commissioners. We then quickly jumped on trying to solicit for our, an RFP for engineers, thinking we have money, this is a project, it's funded. Well, sure, we get an engineer. We had no response to our request for proposals for engineer. So we went back and we were, you know, basically made minor modifications, changed dates, and put it out with a wing of prayer and did obtain an engineering firm parametrics to meet with and take on the project in mid-2022, mid to late 2022. Uh, in late 2022, at the very end of the year, uh, parametrics informed uh, um, Public Works Director Paul Hampton, that there is a significant price deviation be, that they're now seeing in projects with regard to pandemic or pre -pan, early pandemic, pre pandemic project estimates versus the realities of the day, and a multitude of almost two to three times what those numbers were. Um, that, you know, we we're like, well, let's just see if that's going to work its way out. It could be just a market fluke that we, you know, that was our hope. Um, and, but we also had a, a conversation with parametrics and they go, your number one path to clarify or getting a second clarifier on the board, which is essential to the operations of the plant. Second, you need to deal with a, a, a truly modern stand, uh, standby generator. I won't say the one we have is ancient, but it is old. Um, uh, might be, Semi surplus in my mind is what I'm seeing, but um, we notified the county uh, commissioners board of uh, the board and said this is the situation and did it an open meeting with the board. We then went out for bids for the clarifier in the early part the early part of uh, 2023 and um, 2024. Those came back high, uh, significantly high, six to eight hundred thousand dollars short, uh, and then we. For the project we put together at that time, we asked the council to reject those. We put them out, redid the bid with parametrics, put them out for a second bid. Those came in on the 21st of February, 2024, this year. And uh, the bids were higher than we were hoping for the remodified, but they were still within the budget. What was not in parametrics budget was a, a, a significant contingency in case something goes wrong. Um, I'm going to say it this way, God bless the engineer, because they believe that they're, everything will be just as they laid it out. Um, I am not as trusting as that, maybe, and neither is Paul or 
Karen DePue, the, the park treasurer now. And when we started talking about their contingency, they said, well, we put down like a 3.4, 3.5% contingent. And we were like, okay. Um, talked to other groups and they said it should be closer to 10. So we, we went back and back and forth. And then finally it was like, let's put in a request for an additional three hours to $295,000 uh, for that contingency with the, with the request that if the contingency, if the engineer's right, then what, you know, can we be rewarded with their, their unique market predictions, uh, being able to pick up that standby generator. If they're not, we'll be able to stand by generator on our own and, you know, use that as a contingency needs to be used. The, the challenge is the bids this time are valid for 60 days. That expires around the 20th of April and uh, uh, this next month, uh, which is not that far away. And, and so we are, are looking to do uh, this project, having a contingency is essential is our argument. And so the question before you is to, is to address this contingency. And I would say if Providence and good financial management goes our way, it might result not only in that, but potentially also dealing with the standby generator. But we can deal with that on our own. It's a contingency, it's all needed for the project. So that's the summary as to where we are update. Um, questions? Okay. At this point in time, um, on behalf of the guests that might be here, um, I could recognize uh, either written or oral statements from uh, the guests for the meeting. Uh, we would ask that you keep your presentation if you have one or comments under five minutes. And uh, we would ask that you give your name and your address and uh, your position yeah. on this request. So at this point in time, do we have any of the public here or in attendance by Zoom, Lori, that wish to make a statement? And if you're online, if you'd raise your hand, if you'd like to make a statement. All right, seeing none at this point. There's no rebuttal necessary from the applicant at this point because we have no statements that need to be uh, responded to. So I will formally close the public hearing at this point. Now, it's up to you, fellow directors. Um, I'll open this for comments. Anyone that would like to begin and make your comments, questions, or concerns that Rod can then respond to before we vote. Let's start with Joe. Do you have anything you would like to say, question, or point out? Um, from my point of view, I think it's a worthwhile conversation. And we should really can return to us from this. All right. Thank you. Mr. Harmon. It, it seems to me it's just the housekeeping and bringing it up to date uh, activity. And there's so much been going into it so far. We shouldn't stop it now. And so you're in favor. I'm going to be in favor. Thank you, Bill. Sure. Um, I, I concur. It, it sort of seems like a no brainer. Um, anybody knows costs have gone up because of supply chains. So, um, and and I'm leaving this, I got the impression that um, Paramet Matrix appears to be working with you to try and keep the costs down, which is good. So, uh, the final discussion, I would need approval of the proposal. Okay. Um, we are still have to hear from Mark. Could you hold your proposal just for a minute? I didn't see you, Mark. <laughs> Mr. Uh, McAleer, you're hiding in the phone there. You have the floor, sir. Yep. I'm here. Okay. You have any comments? Are you ready? Uh, my comment is that, you know, I think it's just kind of a thing that we have to do. I uh, feel that the commissioners probably really want us to do. So are you ready for a motion? All right, thank you very much. At this point in time, then I will call for the motion. Okay, yeah. like to... I, sure. I move that the Opportunity Fund Board 
recommend to the Board of County Commissioners to approve a grant in the amount of 295000 to support the increased costs of the City of Forks wastewater treatment facility. Thank you, Mike. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Bill Homan. All right, uh, Lori, did you get the proposal? I did. All right, comments, discussion at this point. Seeing none, I'm gonna call uh, for the vote. Could you repeat the motion, please? Okay, the motion is to move that the Opportunity Fund Board recommend to the Board of County Commissioners to approve a grant in the amount of $295,000 to support the increased costs for the City of Forks Wastewater Treatment Facility. Thank you. Clear? All right, I'll call for the question. All in favor of the motion as presented, say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. You're opposing, Mike? Or, oh, I said aye. That was a belated aye. Okay, got it. All right, we have a unanimous vote uh, to accept. The motion carries and is accepted. At this point in time, I want to thank you all for being here, for your input, Rod, everyone here that's had uh, a hand in this. Well done, very clear to the point, and done. I will then adjourn the meeting at this uh, point. One point. Yes. Rod Fleck, you need to, you need to get us another uh, opportunity fund board member. Yes, General, sir. Working on it, sir. We'll have it done soon, sir. <laughs> okay. You have indicated compliance from Forks here. <laughs> okay. Or he's saluting as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enlisted, so he knows that would be a little too far. But. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. You may continue your sojourn. Don't get in trouble out there. We'll see you. Keep turning your little okay. and you'll thank end you. up home. Bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and thank you all for thank being you. here. I greatly appreciate it. And Colleen and your staff, Lori, and everybody for putting it together. Great work. Great. Yep. Thank you. All right. We're adjourned. Well, Rod, I think I think you guys did a really good job. That's three years since we initially did this. Yeah. One yeah. And to keep it within that less than 10 percent in that much yeah. time is a very um and we had to do thing. portions of the project and that's so there's still more we're going to have to work and try to figure out but that's it's been a challenge it's not been easy of course general inflation is way yeah. outpaced what you were able to keep it to. Mm -hmm. all those members that want to keep your stuff or you could leave it here for the if you don't need it i'll leave it here for staff I don't need to take your next time. So home with me. Okay. Great. We're all good.